let's get some cartoons and vodka and do them all night long. Remember a while ago I did a review of a friend's very short webcomic? Well that means I'm definitely qualified to talk about one of the longest ongoing webcomics with an enormous cast of characters and storylines spanning from slice of life romantic drama to high concept discussions of AI sentience. Story time. I first discovered questionable content in I want to say my third year of college. At that point, the comic had been running for about eight years and was at roughly 2,000 individual pages. I proceeded to not sleep for an entire weekend as I read all of it. Not a pleasant experience, but the comic was just so good! What started as a sad white boy into obscure bands dealing with comedic drama slowly evolved into a full world of fascinating people from many walks of life just living their lives in a post-singularity world with AI sentience. It's a bit like watching Scott Pilgrim slowly turn into Steven Universe. I've spent the better part of a decade reading this webcomic every single weekday, so I'm really excited to share it with you. Because that's what people like to get as gifts, 15 years worth of catch-up reading. Great job, Pluto! You nailed it! So anyway, I'm not going to get to all of it, obviously, in this video. This is going to be one of several videos. This one's going to cover from about page 1 to page 500. Page 500. Holy shit, 500 pages! What am I doing? That's longer than this! But yeah, I hope this review slash retrospective will, at the very least, be a useful resource for anyone who wants to get caught up with the comic but doesn't necessarily want to read it straight from the beginning. Right, so this is the very first page, and immediately I have to talk about the art. The art is not good at this point, no siree, and definitely contributes to how many people give up on reading this thing from the very beginning. Creator Jeff Jacques started making this in his spare time and only made it a full-time job after over a year, a timeline of making your internet hobby pay money I'm totally not jealous of, by the way. Just for comparison, this is the first page, and this is the art on one of the later pages of this chunk we'll be looking at. And it continues to improve over the course of the work. Got it? Good. We start this journey with Martin and his anthro PC pint size. The story will eventually explore the implications of AI sentience. For now, it's just for funny, wacky nonsense, and so sad boy loner Martin has someone to talk to. Martin goes out drinking with his buddy Steve so he can complain about his shitty office job and ogle the butts of hot indie chicks. But then the hot indie chick actually talks to him. <gasps> Her name is Faye, and she's new in town and looking to make friends. And she sets some firm ground rules on how she's not looking for romance. Faye is nothing if not creatively violent. You can tell this comic was created by someone still deeply entrenched in the early 2000s music scene. Martin and Faye are talking some awfully specific musical references. Also, the constant uses of the terms indie and later emo. The indie emo battle of the early 2000s was actually a thing, making these early chapters a bit of a time capsule. Like how in this page there's some rather nasty swipes at vegans. Later, most of the characters easily phase shift into hipster. QC starts as a fairly straightforward comedy piece with wacky bits like pint size eating cake batter or this listicle of annoying concert goers. Then Faye manages to burn down her apartment while making toast and moves on to Martin's couch. This establishes what a lot of the early days of QC revolve around, the romantic tension between a sad boy indie nerd and the hot girl he lives with whose past is mysterious. Now I know this is probably setting off alarm bells in your head, like, uh, hey Pluto, this is sounding like a friend zone story, and thank great god Lithalia, it's not. Lithalia? Why not Cthulhu? Shun the non-believer! Faye is clearly fond of Marty, but she is also a giant radioactive spike ball of defense mechanisms, and also likes to show affection by punching people. She takes delight in saying things that can be interpreted as general affection or potential come-ons. And Marty, bless his soul, is nowhere near confident or suave enough to play this game. He's always getting verbally bodied and occasionally actually bodied. 
Now, Steve is a nice guy, but he's a bit of a bro. He doesn't really have the tips for navigating these kind of choppy emotional waters. Pint Size is almost aggressively unhelpful and much more fond of wacky hijinks like becoming the underwear ninja or ceiling walking with science! Brilliant! So we get introduced to Faye's boss, Dora Bianchi. She runs the Coffee of Doom, where Faye works, and her easy, friendly nature sets both Martin and Faye at ease as they become friends. She's also a recovering goth, a fact that Faye takes special delight in ribbing on. But Dora gets her revenge by being far more comfortable with her sexuality than Faye, bringing dildos to work and flashing Martin, cause why not, he's cute. Dora immediately spices up the Faye Martin dynamic, being kinda into both of them, but also valuing their friendship. So we get a third party who wants the relationship, if to not necessarily consummate, to at least not Hindenburg. It's a delicate balance that's easy to miss because of how jokey all three can be with their emotions. The story of QC eventually expands to the point that Martin starts to feel like more of a side character, but at this point in the narrative, he is clearly the POV protagonist and his relationships are paramount. But that doesn't mean other people don't exist in this world, so let's meet the side characters! What? No, not you. Steve goes through some girlfriends at this time. First he dates Sarah from the coffee shop, but that doesn't last long. Sarah is something of an old gag for the comic. She's one of the few characters to legit vanish with no real in-universe explanation. The joke on the cast list is she was eaten by an Allosaurus. Steve then gets a girlfriend named Ellen, but her young age creates some tension early in the relationship. She seeks out Dora and Faye for advice, and the relationship eventually loops in her mosh-pitting roommate and her much older boyfriend Amir, who's important later. In terms of characters who mostly pay off later, we meet Dora's very hot brother Sven, who writes shitty country songs for a living, and there's redneck barfly Jimbo, who gets a job writing hilariously bad romance novels. There's also Raven, former member of Dora's old goth coven and bizarre combination of social bimbo and theoretical physicist. She's ditzy, really into boys, and generally cannot keep up with sarcasm sass masters Faye and Dora. But she's also genuinely kind and capable of amazing feats of scientific brilliance. Jeff seems to like the girl from Mars with secret superpowers trope, cause this isn't his last character like this. At one point, Faye's sister drops by because she got into a huge fight with their mom over getting kicked out of college and coming out as gay. This is funny to me because in modern times, Jeff gets a lot of flack for forcing SJW stuff into his comics because he dares to have a trans character dating someone with minimal drama. Her name is Claire and she's the best. Whereas all the way back in page 164, Faye's sister is getting fairly straightforward support from her family. Her mom was mostly upset about her dropping out of college. Sorry, fuckheads, this was always SJW propaganda. It just used to nominally star a white dude. Now, before I really dive into the closing of this arc of questionable content, I should talk about the robots because this world totally has sentient robots and that's not really important right now. Or I should say it is a thing, but it's still just mostly played for comedy. Pint Size technically functions as a computer and they get some jokes out of that, but mostly he just causes mayhem for the lols. He gets an upgrade after eating too much cake batter so that he has functional limbs. His design is clearly based on what Jeff was comfortable drawing week to week and his bizarro mono limbs will start to stand out as the robotic palette broadens. Oh, and his new chassis is apparently a government model with a death laser in its torso. Eventually, the G-Men come for it, but Faye knocks the man out, she blames it on owls, and Dora removes the laser so Pint Size can keep the rest of the chassis. So robots at this point are mostly for shenanigans, but societal implications are real and will be addressed. Speaking of implications, Faye's intimacy issues have been hinted at over the course of this story. She freaks out a bit too hard when Martin accidentally walks in on her changing, has an intentionally vague past, and a scar on her boob from an accident she is cagey to talk about. It's probably got something to do with her father who died recently, but she does not like talking about it to the point she chokes out her sister before she has a chance to spill any details. Her barely controlled neuroses start to spiral out of control when Martin's mom comes for a visit. Faye is reasonably worried that the mother of the boy she's moving into an apartment with is going to be mad that she hits him all the time. This worry isn't really alleviated by the fact that Martin's mom is a dominatrix fetish model and is intimidating as hell when she wants to be. 
She opens up at the coffee shop about how much she worries that Martin is going to secretly grab her boob while at dinner with his mom and she won't be able to defend herself. Dora is shocked at how constantly worried Faye is, and Faye opens up about how the scar on her chest is from a car accident she had because she had a nervous breakdown while driving. The dinner with Martin's mom stresses her the hell out, and Martin's mom tries to set her at ease while also establishing a hard line in the sand about really hurting her baby boy. The meeting with Marty's mom opens up some issues that will be resolved, but in the interim, a couple stories get progressed. Steve and Ellen have a rough breakup that sends Steve into a drinking spiral. Martin, Amir, and blonde girl I barely remember make plans to start a band. I already mentioned that Martin and Faye got a new apartment together with an actual bedroom for Faye. But during the shopping process, the realtor offhand mentions that the upstairs unit will vacuum at weird hours. Okay, I'm trying not to let my foreknowledge color this retrospective too much, but I'm almost positive this is a reference to a fan-favorite character who doesn't even show up for another 200 pages, and I just think that's damn impressive. But let's close this section out. Faye decides it's time to stop this dance and just straight up ask Martin if he likes her. He stutters through, but yeah, it's obvious he has feelings for the hot girl he spends time with and jokes around with all the time. But Faye is not even close to being emotionally healthy enough to handle a boyfriend, and she knows it. She goes into the tale of her father, how much he meant to her and took care of her, and how he shot himself one morning with basically no warning. He left no note, never showed any signs of depression. Just one day he was no longer there, and it completely crushed Faye. She describes in excruciating detail how she drifted through life in a fog, how she crashed her car, spent some time in a psychiatric care, and two years in therapy getting back to some degree of functionality. Then she moved up north to start over, and here we are. QC is in a totally different category than Control-Alt-Delete, but this is still a masterclass in how to handle a tone shift. It's set up in advance so it doesn't just come out of nowhere, and even in the discussion of this heavy subject matter, humor isn't completely abandoned. So now with all the information out there, Martin lays out his case. He's willing to let his romantic feelings go by the wayside and be Faye's friend, but she's gonna have to commit to actually getting better. Therapy, medication, something. What she's doing now is just stasis and isn't healthy. They make some agreements before going to their respective rooms to cry out the feels. Questionable content is a lot of things. It's funny, it's dramatic, it's romantic, it's about 20-somethings, and it's about robots. But most of all, it's emotionally honest. Almost the whole cast is some degree of self-aware and snarky. They have fun with it, but they also use it to undermine and deflect their own emotions. But eventually that catches up with them, and the story doesn't treat them needing help or reaching out for support as a bad thing. And as a reader, that's just really uplifting to see. I'm glad I got to share this with you. Till next time, I'm Pluto Burns, and this has been Eagle Land.